Great. Um, and it was a nice talk, but I know the next talk is going to be great too. So I'm glad that we have, you know, the 250 people that are with us today are, are hanging in there. Um, because, uh, Avindra Nath, uh, from the, uh, NIH, um, I've heard him talk and it's, his expertise is really profound and, uh, he's, uh, really looking at the neurologic complications of, uh, of COVID-19, some of which Carlos uh, began to introduce. Uh, Dr. Nath is the chief of the section of infections of the nervous system at the uh, National Institute of Neurologic Disease and Stroke at the NIH. And, uh, Avi, welcome to the program today. Yeah, thank you very much for the very kind introduction. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen here. Okay, so I'm going to talk about the neurological complications associated with COVID, and I don't have any uh, financial disclosures. Um, so there are three major objectives. One is that to describe the neurological manifestations, the neuropathological findings, and then long-term uh, complications. So I would like to start with this slide by Sir William Osler. At that time, he was chair of medicine at, at Hopkins, and he uh, addressed the American Medical Association in the Carolinas as a keynote speaker in 1896. And he said that humanity has but three great enemies, fever, famine, and war. Of these, by far the greatest, by far the most terrible is fever. And that actually is true even today. Uh, all the wars combined don't kill as many people as a, a pandemic does. Uh, however, the uh, unfortunate thing is that despite that realization for so long, um, we have failed to learn. Uh, so this is the cover of Times Magazine in 2017, right during the Ebola epidemic. And the cover says uh, we're not ready for the next pandemic. And that's so true because two years later comes the COVID-19 and we found ourselves totally unprepared. Yeah. But uh, the thing is that if you don't control these pandemics, you have social unrest. So, and, uh, and this is from the AIDS uh, pandemic in the 80s. And, um, and you can see ACT UP was born at that time. There was all kinds of social unrest. Uh, and the, uh, uh, here at the Washington Mall, they we put out these quilts and each piece of fabric here represented a person who had died. And, but uh, this social unrest uh, created a lot of, brought about a lot of changes. Um, the way that we approve drugs, the way we do clinical trials, how we involve patients in design of these trials, all those things changed because of um, uh, the, uh, uh, the, uh, the ACT UP and all the uh, social uh, outcry that occurred uh, during that pandemic. And today we face the same dilemma. You're, this time you have 400,000 flags on the, uh, um, on the mall uh, of representing people who had died. And this time they've died over a very short period of time. Uh, in less than a year, you have uh, huge amounts of deaths, so probably half a million people dead just in the United States alone. And so the bis big disconnect is that viruses each year cause devastation in epidemic proportions. They spread very rapidly. And historically, they have wiped out large uh, populations um, over centuries, and uh, and that has shaped the evolution of humans. Because you have one pandemic, it would come and wipe out a huge population. You have few that remain. They would repopulate the planet or whatever geographical region they lived in, and then came another wave of infection and wiped them out again. So, so theoretically, these pandemics could threaten the existence of humans on this planet. Yet, when you look at our therapeutic options, they're very limited for viruses. Um, and that is truly from a lack of trying. All we have is a few drugs for herpes viruses, uh, some for hepatitis, and we have the HIV. But that's it. And there are thousands and thousands of viruses that cause devastation. And yet, we have absolutely nothing uh, to treat any one of them. Right. If you look at the coronaviruses, there are seven human coronaviruses Every one of them causes neurological complications, okay? And certainly we understand SARS-CoV-2 the best, but what I want to draw your attention to is that they use different types of receptors. It's only SARS-CoV-1 that uses H2, and so does SARS-CoV-2. Uh, uh, but all the others that have been studied uh, really have different types of receptors. So the pathophysiology of these viruses is also quite different. 
if you look at the neurological complications, you can uh, divide them into two major subtypes. One that occurs during the viremic phase. Uh, so those are called para-infectious. And these are the post-viral phase, um, whereby you cannot detect active uh, viral replication, but you have these post-viral syndromes. These post-viral syndromes are thought to be all immune-mediated. Certainly the clinical manifestation is, is uh, uh, of an immune-mediated syndrome. Uh, while the uh, para-infectious ones uh, can affect the, um, can cause anosmia, the brain can affect the, um, um, the meninges uh, and cause uh, brainstem abnormalities. Uh, but in total, uh, you put all of them together, they can affect the entire nerve axis. So the brain, spinal cord, nerve, and muscle can all be involved. And uh, by COVID-19. So this is data taken from a study uh, from uh, Chicago and um, where Igor Korolnik and their group, they looked at these uh, hospitalized patients over several hospitals. And their observation was that a third of these hospitalized patients have some alteration in mental status. And two thirds of them at the time of discharge still cannot manage their activities of daily living. And it's independent of their respiratory disease. So it's not like if you have more severe acute illness, you're going to have more uh, neurological problems. They are independent of one another. Certainly, if you have severe respiratory compromise, hypoxic damage can occur to the brain. So the first question uh, that I'd like to pose is, is the uh, uh, that the cause of anosmia in patients with COVID-19 is uh, a infection of the olfactory nerve, the infection of the olfactory bulb, or infection of the olfactory mucosa. Okay, so um, give people a few seconds. And so do we have the results? Okay, so olfactory nerve. So we have chance uh, for each one of them. And actually the uh, answer, the correct answer is really uh, olfactory mucosa, okay? And uh, and so let me show you the evidence for that. Uh, so the reason that the olfactory mucosa is key in causing anosmia is that the ACE2 receptor is present in these cell types called sustenkular cells. Okay, uh, it's not present on the olfactory um, nerve itself. So when you infect these sustenkular cells, you cause a lot of inflammation here in the nose. And that inflammation may compromise uh, the nerve itself due to, uh, uh, you know, edema and uh, all the other things that are being produced by inflammatory cells. But the virus itself does not directly invade the nerve. Mm -hmm. So, um, and that's why there is quite decent recovery from anosmia in most patients. Uh, although you can cause permanent damage of the nerve as well. Um, but, um, and there has been no evidence for the virus itself in the nerve so far. Now, if you, uh, so another major complication with COVID-19 is strokes. And there are multiple different reasons for strokes in these patients. So you can get arterial occlusion, venous occlusion, hemorrhages. And the pathophysiology, we think, is largely related to some coagulopathy or antiphospholipid antibodies but underlying vascular risk factors can predispose a person to developing strokes. So here's question number two, and that is the vascular pathology in COVID-19 patients does not include, uh, one is uh, uh, yeah, endotheliitis, vasculitis, perivascular inflammation, or uh, fibrin uh, clots. Which one is not true here? Okay, let's see what we got. Okay, so we have a good spread over here. And the uh, correct answer is vasculitis, okay? So there's no evidence of inflammation within the blood vessel wall. And in order to have vasculitis, it should be in the blood vessel wall. You do have inflammation around the blood vessel, so you can get perivascular inflammation. But all these other things have been described. So you can have endotheliitis, you can have fibrin clots, and you can have inflammation around the blood vessels, but not in the blood vessel wall itself. Okay, and so here's evidence for 
um, autoantibodies against the phospholipids. And this is a paper that comes out of University of Michigan. And what they did was they took serum from patients. They identified a whole slew of antiphospholipid antibodies here. And, uh, and the levels are decent. Um, they're not very high. Um, and they could be acute phase reactants, I guess. But what they did was they took these, the, the serum here, injected it into mice, and showed the, my, the mice actually developed clots. So they're showing that these antibodies are of functional significance. So if you look at the different types of strokes in these COVID-19 patients, what you find is that some patients can develop multiple arteries and can get occluded at the same time. So this patient has middle cerebral artery occlusion on both sides. Okay, that's extremely unusual. Uh, you can get uh, venous, uh, cerebral venous uh, thromboses and arterial occlusions at the same time. You can get uh, venous occlusions in the lung um, uh, or DVTs along with the stroke at the same time. You can get microhemorrhages within the brain. So you can see that here. All these dark spots here are microhemorrhages. And this is at autopsy. Uh, you can see these congested blood vessels and some microhemorrhages here. And certainly here in the cerebellum, clearly there is a small hemorrhage here. And then um, we did postmortem MRI scans on these um, brains. And what we found was that although you see these congested blood vessels, you also see these high signal intensity lesions. And these are signs of inflammation here. And there are also abnormalities in these uh, blood vessels. Um, and so what I should have pointed out is that in these blood vessels, you can see clots and hemorrhages at the same time. Okay. And then, uh, and this is a paper that was just published uh, last month. And what they showed was, again, you can get these microvascular disease here and hemorrhages again at the same time. And then you can get this inflammation around the middle cerebral artery. So even the large blood vessels can be enhancing. Uh, showing some inflammation around them. So it's not just the small blood vessels. So we just published this paper where we looked at uh, 11 patients. Uh, we looked at 19 patients. 11 out of those 19 were found dead. And uh, uh, so some of them were found dead at home. Um, their uh, spouse or partner found them lying dead in the morning um, in bed. Um, there were some that died in the nursing home also suddenly. Uh, there was an individual who was found dead on a subway in New York. Uh, and uh, another person was just, um, was just playing with his sister and lifting her up and he just fell down and, and dropped dead. So these patients didn't have uh, symptoms that were severe enough to warrant medical attention. So they were all, most of them were at home. Uh, they had, um, if they had anything, it was mild disease. At autopsy, they all had some lung involvement and all were PCR positive through nasal swabs. So they had active viral replication at that time. So relatively early in the course of the illness. So what I'll show you is they had three different types of pathology that were present in the brain. So first we looked at the olfactory bulb here. And um, so we did an MRI scan of the olfactory bulb. And this is using an 11 Tesla scanner. So nobody's ever put a human brain through an 11 Tesla scanner before. So these are the very first images that have been produced and uh, that I'm sharing with you. And then we did um, immunohistochemistry on them. And what, what I'm showing you here is all this green stuff that you see here is fibrinogen leakage into the parenchyma. That shows that the blood vessels are compromised and these fibrinogen is leaking from the blood into the parenchyma uh, of the uh, olfactory bulb. And if you follow this blood vessel here, this is immunostaining the, the wall of the blood vessel, looks really nice, and then it fades away, suggesting there's compromise here, and that's how it's leaking through here. There's another blood vessel stains for a little bit and then disappears. Here in the brain stem, you see the same thing. You see these multiple uh, foci of leakage of fibrinogen, showing that there's compromise of these blood vessels. So really what they have is a vasculopathy. And this is that same image of that blood vessel here. And let me see if I have a high power. Yeah, I have a high power um, uh, image here. And uh, so this vessel is now blown up over here. And you can see two uh, important changes. If you look at the wall of the blood vessel, you see a hyper intense lesion around the wall. That suggests inflammation. And you see a clot inside this blood vessel. Now, this is the same blood vessel below, but just oriented slightly more differently. 
this line runs through the wall of the blood vessel and you would expect it to be smooth like this. However, you see this little bulge here and that's because there's a micro hemorrhage here. So you're seeing three pathologies in the same blood vessel, a clot, inflammation, and a micro hemorrhage all at the same time. If you immunostain for cell types, what you find is that there are macrophages infiltrating through the bulb here. Uh, lots of macrophages. All these brown cells are macrophages. You find them in microglial nodules. You can see lots of them here. This is in the brain parenchyma. And then you can see CD8 cytotoxic T cells around the blood vessels as well. So, and here in the meninges. So we say predominantly uh, uh, CD8 T cells and macrophages infiltrating in the brain. When we looked at the neurons, we found that in the brain stem, there was compromise of the neurons. Again, this is a beautiful image uh, taken by an MRI scanner here. You can see all the different parts of the, uh, of the brain stem. But importantly, what we see is this phenomenon called neuronophagia, whereby you see these macrophages all around the neuron trying to engulf it. And uh, and you can see these microglial activation, all these brown cells uh, around these neurons. And these are all the various nuclei. And one of them is the pre-Bodzinger complex, which is what controls the respiratory uh, system. And importantly, remember, these patients, most of them had died suddenly. So one possibility is that either they had a cardiac arrhythmia, and that's what kills them, or it could even be a respiratory compromise uh, from the brainstem. And this is from a group in Germany. Now, they showed similar kinds of inflammation. You can see CD8 cells and uh, uh, macrophages and microglial cell activation in the brain. The difference is that we never found evidence of virus in the brain. And we did all kinds of PCR analyses, RNA-seq, and cytohybridization, and uh, immunostaining. But they claimed that by PCR, they could detect small amounts of virus in nearly half of their patients. So, but it was really uh, at the borderline of detection. So I'm not too sure. I think the, it's fair to say that there's no overwhelming viral infection in the brain. If there is any, it's very small amounts. So what the target of these immune cells is, is not clear to any of us. Okay, so... Uh, so how would you classify SARS-CoV-2 then? Is it neurotropic, neuroinvasive, or neurovirulent? Okay, what do we have for answers? Okay, so you know, we have uh, about half the people think that uh, it could be neurovirulent. Okay, and the uh, correct answer is... Let's see. Okay, so you're right. So here are the definitions. Uh, neurotropic means that they're capable of infecting nerve cells. And I showed you that we really could not find infection of any of the parenchymal cells within the brain. Neuroinvasive means it's capable of entering the nervous system. Again, I guess uh, the Germans did claim that small amounts can probably enter in there. Um, so we could give you partial credit for that. But it's neurovirulent, and that's for sure. It's capable of causing disease within the central nervous system, and that part is certainly true. If you look at the different types of encephalitis that you see in these patients, there you can broadly classify them into three different types of encephalitis. One is viral encephalitis, extremely rare. So there are only two or three case reports in the literature whereby these patients have presented with a generalized seizure, neck stiffness, suggestive of meningitis, and detection of the virus in the spinal fluid. Otherwise, most of us have uh, been unable to uh, find virus in the CSFs. Um, then there's a second type that's called acute disseminated encephalomyelitis, and this is a T-cell mediated syndrome. You'll get um, enhancing lesions within the brain and in the spinal cord. As you can see, this high signal intensity lesion here in the spinal cord, there's ring enhancing lesions uh, here in the, in the brain. And um, uh, so these patients uh, usually respond to immunotherapy. So uh, they, it was treated with IVIG and high-dose uh, corticosteroids. Then there's a third form, and that's called acute necrotizing hemorrhagic encephalopathy. And uh, this is a very interesting phenomenon. Uh, you see, usually starts in the thalamus. They're bilaterally symmetrical lesions in the thalamus, as you can see on this flare image. And here on the SWI image, you can see all this blood. And here, all these dark spots of blood. 
in the thalamus itself. But the, uh, the lesion can also be present in other parts of the brain, but it's almost always bilaterally symmetrical. And that's because it's thought to be cytokine mediated. Okay. So you have different, uh, pathophysiology of each of these, uh, three syndromes. Then there's this uh, one paper uh, just came out from Spain and uh, they described five patients all in their ICU. Okay. And they've been there for at least two months each. And, but they describe two different patterns. What they say is that you look at the first three patients, they have these small punctate lesions here on the MRI scan. Okay. And they've been there uh, neurologically devastated for at least two months. Then what they decided to do was treat everybody with, um, plasmapheresis and, uh, uh, IV steroids. And three of them that had these punctate lesions actually showed a pretty decent response. Two of them an excellent response, one partial response. Then you had these two others that had much more diffuse lesions throughout the brain and they had absolutely no response. So by MRI criteria, you could probably divide them into two different categories and it's important because it has therapeutic implications. Then lastly, there is this in critically ill patients, they develop this white matter change of some kind of encephalopathy. It's quite possible this is related to all kinds of other systemic um, abnormalities. Um, but the true pathophysiology of this is not entirely clear. But you can see this is very different than everything else I'm showing you because it's extremely diffuse okay, and kind of homogeneous pattern. Okay, so what happens long-term to these patients? So yeah, this is a you know, paper published by you know, Oxford. And uh, what they showed was they compared to influenza patients and they showed that the uh, uh, incidence of uh, psychiatric illnesses, but the mood disorder, anxiety disorder is much higher in the COVID-19 patients compared to those patients who may have been affected by influenza alone. And uh, these two diverge the further out you go. So even three months out, you can see that there's uh, significant uh, psychiatric uh, complications in these patients. Then um, you, uh, the cranial nerves can also get involved. Um, and so there's Miller-Fisher syndrome and uh, uh, polyneuritis uh, um, involved in several of the cranial nerves, uh, resulting here in oculomotor abnormalities and ophthalmoparesis, here's another patient here. And it can also involve the roots lower down in the spinal cord. So this is involvement of L5, and you can see all these enhancing roots on both sides. And this is a beautiful MRI scan showing this going all the way down into the psoas muscle. But the important thing is that these patients respond to IVIG. So it has treatment implications. Um, and then you can also get a myositis. So this is an MRI scan of the thigh, and you can see necrotic muscle fibers right in the middle here. This dark stuff is myonecrosis. And pathologically, you can see infiltration of all these inflammatory infiltrates here, degenerating and regenerating uh, muscle fibers here at the same time. And that, again, is important because they do respond to treatment with uh, methylprednisone. But in all these cases, if you're going to treat methylprednisone, you got to give them a high dose. I've seen that a lot of other physicians, non-neurologists, treat them with very small dosages. And they say, I didn't do anything. Uh, in most of these things, you got to hit them hard if you want to uh, really have an impact. And then there are these um, other long-term complications, which are uh, called the long-haul COVID or post-acute uh, COVID-19. And um, fatigue being an important uh, manifestation in these patients. So they have... It's a very interesting type of fatigue. It's really is exercise intolerance. And if you exercise them more, they don't get better. They actually get worse. So I had one cardiologist who told me that uh, she takes one flight of stairs and she's wiped out for the rest of the day. She couldn't even do telemedicine after that. So it is uh, extremely devastating. Um, um, and uh, they all complain of memory dysfunction. Um, um, and it's uh, world finding difficulties or concentration problems. In some patients, it's postural, uh, so that when they lie down, they can think better. If they stand up, they think less. They can think very clearly. So there's a postural hypotension that's associated with it as well. Uh, headache is not uncommon, all kinds of pain syndromes, a lot of sleep abnormalities, and certainly anxiety and depression is no surprise. 
these are the types of autonomic uh, symptoms that patients have described. Uh, tachycardia with very mild exercise or just with standing. Uh, night sweats, temporary dys- dysregulation. Uh, they can have mild fever, uh, which I think is probably immune mediated. Uh, and GI complaints uh, and peripheral vasoconstriction. Complain of tingling in their hands and feet usually turns out to be vasoconstriction, not necessarily a neuropathy. So we have two studies ongoing right now um, at um, NIH. One is to enroll, it's an observational study for all kinds of neurological manifestations. And the other is really focused particularly on these long haul COVID patients that mimic uh, chronic fatigue syndrome. And we're happy to take referrals for any of these studies. So the major unanswered questions are that the target of immune cells remains unknown. The mechanism of viral spread to the brain uh, is still uh, unknown, uh, and we don't even know whether it actually does. Uh, characterization of the post-COVID syndrome neurological sequelae still needs to be done, and we need to think about intervention studies. And I think we can't wait to understand pathophysiology. As our understanding of pathophysiology improves, we should uh, conduct intervention studies simultaneously. So I'd like to acknowledge a number of neuropathologists who helped us with our neuropathology study, people in my lab who did all the work, all the uh, MRI work was done by them. And Walter Korshex is our institute director who's been instrumental in helping us uh, do all these studies. I'll stop here and take any questions. Thank you very much. Um, and obviously a, a wealth of expertise that you shared with us. I, I have a couple questions. Kind of one is a Pretty, probably a pretty stupid one. IVIG is that just regular old IVIG? Regular like, old IVIG. Yeah. Not not anything with yeah. SARS-CoV-2 specific. Yeah, not the because um, there are some uh, preparations. Of, yeah. yeah, there the are some preparations. Yeah, like yeah. yeah. So the reality is that by the time we are giving these things, the virus is gone already. So you're not okay. neutralizing the virus. You're actually treating the immune syndrome. So any IVIG should do the job. And and you made made the point early in your talk that uh, SARS-CoV-2 is one of a, a number of coronaviruses. Um, and is any I'm 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 astounded at the range of neurological problems that that you're that you're seeing. Is, is any of this common in SARS yes. uh, itself? Uh, is this is this unique to CoV-2, or is it uh, uh, more common of the of the class of viruses? Yeah. So many of them have been described with the previous coronaviruses. And the thing is that the number of patients affected by those viruses was much, much smaller than what it is with SARS-CoV-2. So certainly we've seen a lot more complications and we've seen um, uh, a larger numbers with this. Um, so uh, we may have under-recognized the number of neurological complications with the previous ones. Great. Um, uh, Carlos, in his talk, um, made the point that the, the this long haul s- syndrome can be seen even in people that were uh, mildly symptomatic it wasn't necessarily just in the really sick people and, and of the things that you've described uh, are are the neurologic long term complications uh, uh, more or less restricted to severely ill people or is this something that that can be seen even in the mildly symptomatic yeah, you can see it in mildly symptomatic individuals. So it's independent of the respiratory involvement. So it's certainly, and so I usually like to classify them into two. One is the sick, sick patients. They have neurological complications, but most often it's due to involvement of heart, and lungs, or kidney, or something like that. And then you have the other patients where the systemic manifestations were very mild, and then they have all these neurological problems afterwards. And so that's a very interesting cohort in our mind, and it's quite possible that's immune-mediated uh, phenomena in those patients. So um, a number of questions, um, and um, one of my good friends, Catherine Kosurik, is uh, is with us uh, from Oregon and uh, wonders about aspirin. Is this effective to reduce strokes? Um, should everyone be taking aspirins? Yeah, I don't know. Aspirin may not be sufficient. <laughs> so the coagulopathy, when it occurs, is very dramatic, and it's pretty bad, uh, and you get multiple artery occlusion. So in fact... If, and there, the severity of the illness does matter. And the more severe, the more the coagulopathy. And so in hospitalized patients, the recommendation now is to anticoagulate and do full uh, anticoagulation, not even this half-hearted subcutaneous stuff is not sufficient. But I've seen patients on uh, subcutaneous heparin and still develop clots all over the place. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you got to go full code. And even if you have microhemorrhages in the brain, don't worry about it. It's still anticoagulate. 
<laughs> and if, and if patients are, are if patients for whatever reason are on um, some of the direct anti- anticoagulants, Eliquis is an example. Uh, yes. Does that have any effect in this? Yes, Eliquis is a good drug to take. Um, and a uh, number of people have been put on those. And then we don't have controlled studies, so we don't really know. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And so that's the caveat. I, I love this comment from one of the participants. Um, uh, it's it's too bad more people don't know about what you're seeing because maybe that would help young people uh, move towards vaccination and other prevention measures. Cause I, I think this is, you know, some of these things are just so devastating to see. It's unfortunate. The thing is with, uh, I can tell you with every pandemic, there's people, uh, the neurological complications always occur. It doesn't matter Ebola, HIV, you know, you can take any of these things, dengue, whatever. And But the realization that the brain is getting involved doesn't occur at the time when the pandemic occurs. It's always much, much late. So people get focused on the first organ involvement that they see, and they don't realize that the brain is getting involved. Once those acute manifestations are gone, what is left behind is all the neurological complications. Where the brain doesn't repair itself, the other organ systems do to some degree. And so we are left holding the bag. All neurologists are left holding the bag of every pandemic for years afterwards. But most people don't realize it much, much later. So we uh, really need a totally different way of thinking about pandemics. I think neurologists need to get involved very early in these things. And we need to get the word out and we need to study them uh, and not wait till the uh, bitter end. I'm convinced and hopefully the the cohorts that uh, Carlos is talking about as a, as a direction for future research will include good ne- <laughs> neurologists and neuropathologists as well. Are you involved in any of those? Uh, yes. I mean, we have our own two cohorts own that cohorts. I just yeah, told yeah. you about at, uh, at NIH. And then there are other cohorts at NIH that NIID and other institutes are doing. So we work very closely with one another so that, uh, and we have a very good relationship. And largely, it's a lot of the HIV people are doing these things now. And over the years, we've developed a very good relationship with them, and they realized the importance of neurological complications in that uh, in that population over there too. It took many years. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, HIV was uh, uh, isolated in '83, and complications were in in the '70s also. But it wasn't until about '86 that the first paper was published on neurological complications showing virus in the brain. So, but now we have a good relationship with them, so it's uh, working out much better. So a couple questions about um, uh, neurologic sequelae of the vaccine. Have you, have you heard yes. of any um, of these and what similarity might they have to the stuff you're seeing in the actual infection? Yeah, so I don't want to scare people away, but yes. I don't. <laughs> <There are> neurological <laughs> complications. And there are several of them. So uh, almost everybody develops some kind of fever-like response, flu-like symptoms that last about two to three days and they go away, all right? So, but then there are people who, there are people who have Bell's palsies. There are people who have, uh, there are paresthesias. It's not uncommon on the arm that people have been injected with. And you can get tingling sensation there for some time. But almost all of these things get better. There are, with the AstraZeneca, there are some patients that developed a transverse myelitis like picture. And, uh, and that also got better. And there are a couple of people I know who develop some kind of autonomic dysfunction, and it's taking a little while for them to get better. But 99.9 of them, even if they do develop neurological symptoms, they do get better. And uh, if they're immune mediated, you can treat them with steroids. Yeah. Great. Um, another question about steroids. Um, any rationale for using oral steroids in early diagnosis of outpatients? Um, you know, you said when when you have a bad disease, you have to blast it. But is there any role for uh, yeah, early uh, enough? Er, the thing is that if you give steroids too early during the viremic phase, then you blunt the immune system, and that's your only way to control the virus. And we don't have an antiviral drug. For example, with bacterial meningitis, you have good antibiotics. You can give steroids at the time of diagnosis because you know the antibiotics will take care of the bacteria. So the earlier if you give the steroids in a patient with bacterial meningitis, the better off you are. Here, you don't have an antiviral drug. You don't have an antiviral drug. You're dependent upon the immune system. If you suppress the immune system, the virus is going to cause havoc. So you have to wait till the post-viremic phase to give steroids, uh, or at least towards the tail end. So you mentioned in passing plasmapheresis. Is, do you see that as playing a role in, uh, in, in the treatment of these severe complications? Yeah, I think plasmapheresis is actually better than anything because you're not only just taking out the antibodies, you take out a lot of other junk along with it too. 
So, uh, but giving plasmapheresis is not easy because, you know, you're contaminating the machines and an acute work patient. Uh, it, it's not, there's not easy access there. And then, you know, there's volume depletion issues that you have to have good cardiac function for this. So, but if it can be done and can be done safely, I think that would be the treatment of choice. So uh, an interesting question. Uh, do you see more of the uh, neurologic complications in people with a history of substance use? I don't know the answer to that, but uh, I would not be surprised. No, because a lot of these substance use compromise the brain. And we know that if you have a compromised brain and you're put on anything, it's one and one does not make two. One and one makes four. So yeah. you always see more complications. Of it. Patients who have Alzheimer's, or subclinical Alzheimer's, they get COVID or any kind of infectious process end up in the ICU. They never come back out the same, you know. Grandma goes in with um, uh, pneumonia, comes out demented, she's never the same. Peripheral neuropathy is a component in the long haul syndrome. See that? Yes, we're seeing small fiber neuropathies and autonomic. Uh, I guess that's what you're saying that with the uh, set one peppercorns uh, <laughs> tingling uh, of the. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Got it. Well, thank you uh, very much. That was that was oh, a, a wonderful summary and a, and a great way uh, to have the last lecture of the program. But now I get to turn it back to Susan Buckbinder uh, to uh, kind of help thank you for participating and let you know some of the other programs that we're going to be doing. Susan?